All right. So like I like I was saying, you know, film photography um, was the way how photography was invented. And that's how pictures were taken 30, 20 years ago um, before all the era of digital photography. So we want to learn a little bit about the technique, how it works, and some of the technical elements that are used to produce pictures and to produce to produce um, images. So first of all, what's the main difference between digital and film photography? So basically a film camera, like the one that I show you, the one that I have on my hands, and if you can see my picture, probably you can see this one. Basically this, um, this camera will store the capture images, images in film, which can be later processed and will be printed. The digital um, camera, which it has a sensor, a digital camera can be your phone or a Canon, a Nikon, a Sony camera, whichever you have. Uh, and the sensor will store the images in a memory card. And of course you can use the memory card and delete images as much, uh, as, much as you want. With the film, when you take the picture, it's over. You cannot reuse film, you only gonna use it once. So let's define what's photography. Photography is basically the art of, or practice of taking and pro processing photographs. Also, another definition can be the art of producing images by the action of radiant energy and especially light on a sensitive, and a sensitive surface such as film or an optical sensor. So, and what's the main reason or the main purpose of photography? Um, in this digital era of like Instagram, TikTok, uh, Facebook, uh, all we do is post pictures and post uh, videos all the time, but like what's the main purpose behind photography? At the end of the day, the main idea behind photography is to communicate, to communicate visually, to send a message, to, to tell people uh, something throughout images and throughout illustrations. So essentially the, pur the purpose of photography is communication. Few people take pictures uh, just for themselves. Most of us, we take pictures because we want them to be seen by others. And like I said, we want we want to tell a message to other people. So however, whichever is the message, we use photography as a way of visual communication. So let's explain the process of the camera construction. The easiest way to explain this and the simple uh, in a simple way we will talk about a pinhole camera, which is basically a camera that you can make at home with like a box or a few simple materials. Basically the camera is, is a summary um, of the way how digital or how film or any fancy camera works. It's a simple way to describe the process of a camera uh, taking a picture or producing images. So basically how you see here on the illustration, a pinhole camera is a simple camera with our lens, but it has a tiny up, a tiny aperture or a tiny hole. So basically uh, it is a light proof box, which a small hole in one side, light from one scene pass through the aperture of, and pro, and pro, I'm sorry, and projects an inverted image of the opposite side of the box, which is known as a camera obscura effect. So as I told you, as you can see on the illustration, it gives you an idea of how this pinhole camera works. And like I said on my explanation, it's a simple way to describe how a fancy or a bigger camera works. So just to give you an idea how light comes to the camera and how it produces um, the image that we see on our cameras when we take a picture. What are camera lenses? So basically all cameras have a lens, even, even our iPhones, even though we don't see, we don't see the lens, but the, and especially the new iPhones, it has three lenses. It has different types of lenses and each lens, different lenses, they give you uh, different uh, results or different looks on your picture. Uh, basically uh, we can see a few different lenses here um, on the slideshow. And basically a camera lens is usually has an aperture adjustment me me mechanism to control the amount of light that pass that may pass through the lens. It also has a shutter to control the length of time during which light may pass through the lenses. So basically with different lenses and with different settings, we control how much light 
can go through our cameras, how dark, how big, how crispy, uh, or pictures can be. So the land has a lot of saying when taking pictures, even if it's digit digitally, or if we're doing um, field or traditional photography. So the effects of light on sensitive film, like I show you on my camera, and you can see it here. So basically film, uh, and if you can see my picture, probably you can see me. So basically this, these are film, the ones that I have on the, uh, no, wait, actually, let me just remove the filter that I have, no, that's fine. Well, you can see it on the, uh, on the PowerPoint. So basically photographic film is a sheet of plastic, which is coated with, with an emul emulsion containing light sensitive silver, um, highly salt. Basically, uh, the film that we, those films that you're seeing there, they have different um, speed. And basically the speed uh, tells you how sensitive uh, the film is to light. So basically uh, film, uh, is we're gonna film, we use film to put it inside the camera to produce the pictures. And depending on how much light we let into the camera, uh, it will determine how, you know, how, how dark or how uh, bright the images are going to be when we're taking pictures with that old film um, camera. So the action of develop of developers. So once we take the pictures um, on a film camera and once we use the film, we had to take the film, uh, take it out of the camera and we had to take the film either to a professional to develop the film for us or we can do it at home. So, and remember like how I said before, this is, this is the way how photographs were taken in the past. All that we know today, Instagram filters and cameras, all of that is based in the process of film photography that till today is still being used, but it's not as common as how it was before, because before it was the only way to produce photographs. So uh, the process of uh, developing field, like I told you, it can be done by a professional or you can do it at home. I had done it at home myself plenty of times. I don't do it anymore, but when I was in a school, I used to do it almost every week. Uh, it's an easy and simple process, basically, they, there are uh, different um, liquids that we have to use uh, in, in a dark room to, de to develop the film, to process, to process the pictures and to make prints. Uh, we're gonna watch a quick video, it's probably like a four minute video, which is gonna explain the process a little bit, um, you know, as it's a, a quick video, just to show the process of how we can develop film at home. It's one of the many ways that we can do it. And it's just to give you an idea how people used to print pictures before like 20, 30 years ago, before we have any, any digital um, um, cameras or any digital iPhones. Okay, let's play this. I tend to limit myself shooting more black and white because of the developing process. I don't shoot enough to consider buying the chemicals and labs generally tend to take longer to process black and white. Some of them don't even do it anymore. So this week I thought I'd try out the Cine Still Mono Bath, which is supposedly one of the easiest ways to develop your black and white film at home. This chemical is a mono bath, which means that it takes care of the whole developing process with a single chemical. It's also not even crazy expensive. This stuff runs about $20 per bottle and it says you can do 16 rolls. So in order to use this, you're gonna need a couple things. You need a developing tank, which allows you to pour this liquid in and out of the tank without light going in and touching your film. I just use these Patterson developing tanks. I'll have links in the description to where you can find all the stuff you need. These are pretty cheap and they work well. I load the film up in my bathroom and then I walk out with this tank into the light and I can pour the chemicals in and out. The next thing you're gonna need is a couple rolls of film to develop. I'm gonna try both medium format and 35 millimeter. I'm curious to see if the developer will have different results depending on the format. And of course, lastly, you're gonna need a bottle of Cine Still Developer. This stuff is called DF96 and it comes in a liter bottle. That's enough for two rolls of medium format at once or two rolls of 35 millimeter. The first thing you wanna do is load the film. If you've never done this before, I would definitely recommend you practice once before with 
a blank roll of film, just practice loading it into the reels in the light because once you get into the dark, it gets surprisingly difficult. So what's cool about this is that you don't necessarily have to heat up these chemicals even. They give you different developing times for different room temperatures that this chemical might be at. I just decided to heat mine to 80 degrees Fahrenheit because that's what's recommended and that's what gives you the shortest developing time, which is three minutes. So to do this, I just place the chemical in a tub of water in my bathtub and I let hot water run over it until it got to 80 degrees. This only took about a minute or so, so I don't think it adds too much to the process to complicate it, but it's definitely an extra step, although you don't have to do this. The next thing I did after my film was loaded and my chemicals were warmed up was just rinse the tank with water. I like to have the recommended temperature water, which is 80 degrees. Uh, this just allows the tank to heat up too so that when you pour in the chemicals, it doesn't immediately cool down your developer. Once you've poured in the chemicals, you can go ahead and agitate the tank. Just try to have like an even agitation pattern so that the developer is kind of spreading evenly on the film so you don't get any weird development marks. Once the timer hits zero, you can go ahead and pour the chemicals back into the bottle because the stuff is reusable. You can do about 16 rolls with this, which is a pretty good amount. I rinsed my film a couple of times after this just to clean off any of the remaining developer and just wash off all the chemicals. And then you can take out the film and have a look at it. It's really that easy and I was so surprised by how well this works. I've been developing black and white film with a much longer process at school for the past year and I just thought it was really cool to be able to try out this developer that somehow magically does it in three minutes. Of course there is a little bit of a trade-off for this. Um, the film is slightly more contrasty when you use this kind of developer. I definitely noticed this more in the 35 millimeter than I did in the medium format but nonetheless I don't think it's a bad look by any means and I think the photos that I developed with this turned out pretty cool. The photos also came out with pretty standard grain which I thought was awesome. Um, I thought that for some reason using this developer which seems almost too quick would make the photos much grainier but they have a really nice even grain and I think it's a good look. Obviously this developer only works with black and white film which is kind of the one downside. I don't think a developer like this will ever exist for color film but it's cool to know that if you only shoot a couple rolls of black and white a month that there's an easier way to develop it than buying a whole set of chemicals. You can just buy this one bottle and be All right, guys. So basically that was a quick, um, uh, that, that video was basically a quick explanation of how the process of developing field go. Of course, it takes longer because when you actually are making prints in a dark room, um, it's a little bit of a longer process because it takes time to get the right settings, to get the right picture. And in, in a way, even though today film photography may not feel relevant and it may feel that it is a way too complicated and longer process, it's a way to appreciate uh, the, you know, the advance and the facility that we have to take pictures now. Just understanding the process gives, gives you an idea how much progress we have made coming from film photography to now just grabbing an iPhone and taking pictures. And at the end of the day, even though it's a long process, it's a little bit longer process and it takes a lot of steps, definitely, um, you can enjoy it. And it's an activity uh, that I used to do when I was in school. I don't do it as often anymore because of time, but it's a, it's a really nice hobby to actually get into it and to learn um, all the process behind and to actually do it at home. And you know, at the end of the day, you will feel very happy and very proud when you actually get a picture that is, um, you know, like a really nice picture well taken and you were able to do the, all the process 
um, yourself. So. <laughs> All right, so let's go to the next uh, slide. Uh, I tend to limit my sorry. All right, so base uh, this one. What is the mean by the speed of film? So, like I show you on my camera, and like you saw on the video, he had two different types of film. There are different types of film and different types of film cameras. There are like thirty-five millimeters medium format, large format, there's a ton of different ones. So in each film has a specific number, as you can see here on the image, the ISO uh, at 100, which is the speed of the film. And what would what does speed mean? Basically, it will the speed means how sensitive the film is going to be to light. For example, you can see the candle on the image. It shows you uh, the different numbers and how sensitive depending on how low, on how high is the number, how sensitive the film can be to live and the different results that you are going to have on your image, depending on the speed or on the number of the film. Next one, uh, what does ASS or ISO mean? Basically, uh, in today, ASA is not, it was discontinuing. So basically all cameras, are a standard with with ISO and ISO basically is used um, how sensitive uh, is your film of your digital camera to light. So basically with the ISO, the higher the number, the more sensitive and the more life that you are going to have on your picture. The lower the number, basically your picture is going to be a little bit darker or graining depending on your lighting situation. So basically that's the standard. It was back in the days, it was a little bit different and it was, it has, it had like different numbers and different um, regulations, but at the end of the day, all companies, they came together and they agreed to create just a standard ISO for all cameras all across the, the world, uh, brands. And it doesn't matter which camera, basically they all use the same system and the same standards um, to determine how sensitive uh, um, the numbers of the ISO um, are. How are shutter speed, lenses, uh, and the film speed related? So basically, this is like the holy trinity because they all three work together to create a perfect picture. So basically, one depends on the two others. So if you don't have one, you cannot have the other. And you, if you only have two and you don't have the other, you won't be able to create an, a perfect image or to create a pe perfect picture. It doesn't matter if it's a digital picture or if it is a film picture. You actually me these three friends together in order for you to uh, have a good final result. For example, uh, sorry, like it says here, basically the shutter speed is the time in which the shutter the shutter is basically open for you while you're taking a picture to allow the light to go into the camera. Basically, the aperture is how big is uh the 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 lens is gonna open how much light is gonna is gonna is gonna come through your lens so basically the, the speed is how long the aperture is how many and the film speed which is basically can be the iso is how sensitive it's gonna be to light so basically the perfect combination of those three will keep you a perfect image that you can normally can take with your iphone or you can take with the film camera is the combination of those three. It's kind of like, uh, like I said, it's kind of like the holy, the holy trinity. So they all, they, they, they all three work together to give you a perfect and final result. So uh, again, the bit, the basic and principal uses of photography. Uh, sorry, ah, so, all right. So going back here. So basically, photography. Uh, this is something similar to what I shared in the first few slides. Basically, photography is the process of recording pictures by means of capturing live on a live sensitive medium. So as a film or sensor, uh, live patterns reflected or emitted from objects that are exposed a sensitive chemical or electronic medium during, during a time. So basically, like I said in the previous slides at the beginning, um, this is the process uh, that defines photography uh, and why do we take pictures? So now we're gonna see a few different examples of different um, techniques of how to capture images or how um, take 
different types of pictures. This can be either film or digitally or with an iPhone, however you want. Those are just different ideas and examples that you can actually put on practice even with your, with your iPhone. You can practice these really simple um, techniques uh, to create really cool um, images uh, with, uh, with whatever camera or like phone you have. For example, framing. Framing, framing basically means that you're gonna be creating a framing of your picture using whatever you have, um, like natural frames. For example, uh, you can see looking in the middle, you can see looking through a window, how the entrance of this palace is framing the, 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 the building that's, that's outside. Or you can see how the lady is going through the door and she's in the center of the door. Uh, and basically this is creating a frame within a frame. Basically we're framing to bring attention to our subject and to make it, to give, to give the subject, the subject more um, relevant um, in, in, on our pictures. Uh, basically, cam um, camera steadiness. Basically, when you take pictures, you don't want your pictures to look like the one, <coughs> I'm sorry, like the one on the right that is so blurred and so shaky that you cannot see anything. When you take pictures, you have to be really careful and try to be uh, stable to get images that are like the one on the left that are really crispy and are really well taken and you can actually see what's on the, on the picture. Uh, Louise, so before, yeah. just before you go ahead, uh, going back to the previous one about keeping the camera steady, yeah. I've yeah. always heard, and I try and do this myself, is actually to hold your breath while you're taking the photo. Yes. Because um, mm -hmm. that just keeps it steady um, while you're doing it. Yeah. Something that I normally... People who take yeah. pictures to, to place a photo, don't do that. Ex exactly. <laughs> but at the moment when you click, hold your breath and it does work. Yeah. Something that I normally do myself, like I once I hold my breath in two, I always try to hold my phone like this and then and then just be in this position that way I'm really stable and I'm not moving. Basically, I, I'm like I, I'm like a human tripod and that way I know either if I'm taking video or pictures, it's gonna be a stable and it's gonna be well taken. So basically, I, my elbows, I'm like, I'm resting them like right next, kind of like on my belly like this and I'm just like this. <laughs> All right, so let's see. Do, 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 uh, next one. Which is, so, which is actually really cool, uh, Mr. Luis, because some kids think that you have to have like this fancy tripod in order to do good photography, but the human tripod works really well. Yes, yeah, definitely. <laughs> elbows, on, elbows on your tummy, legs a little bit apart, and you can do a lot of tripoding without the fancy equipment that a lot of Pathfinders don't have access to. <laughs> definitely. And you know, like, and it's funny because, like, even though, um, you know, we, we it, it's a huge difference from what we're talking about here, in, like film photography, but like with our iPhones, they, you know, like the the possibilities are limited. The things that you can create with a, just a simple iPhone in terms of video and like pictures, you will be surprised what you can do if you know how to maximize your iPhone and how you know how you can use the resources that you have on hand. Use using like flashlights or like your own TV or like anything that you have at home that you can create, that you can use to create amazing pictures, you'll be surprised how you can create amazing images without having to spend like thousands of dollars on like fancy cameras or like fancy um, equipment. Just being resor resor resourceful in using what, what you have um, on your hands. So this is another technique, the direction of, of light. Uh, depending how the song um, is facing you, it's gonna create a different effect on your photograph. For example, the one on the left, you can see how the song is, is behind the, the little le girl, and you can see how it's creating a silhouette. The one in the middle, the song is facing directly on her face, and you can see how everything is uh, well laid up, and you can see all the details. And then the last one, you can see how the song is coming from the side, and it's giving you, it's showing one side, and the other side is really dark, creating this like dramatic effect. So that tells you, depending where your light source is, it's gonna give you a different lighting situation. All right, let's see, next one. This one, panning background. Basically for this one, uh, what, we were talk, what, we were, what we were mentioning before, for this one, um, if we want to create sim something similar to this, it will be um, easy to do it if we 
if we go this way, you know, like elbows close to the tummy and trying to be really stable to create something similar to this um, effect and try to make sure that the focus of the camera is on the subject that we're trying to capture. Rule of thirds, one of my favorite ones. This is so funny. Um, when you actually uh, take pictures on the camera and actually on your phone, there is this grid that you can see with like the lines. And basically the rule of, thir rule of thirds, what it's telling you is like, whatever is between those, where do you see where the dog is or probably the, where the dog is, basically <clears throat> your eyes are gonna go straight to that. The first thing that you see when you look at a picture using the rule of thirds is whatever, it is between those points that are like in the center, that's gonna be the focus of attention. And that's where you, your eye is gonna go directly. It's an easy way to actually highlight something on a photograph and make it like the center of attention of your pictures. Different angles, this is a high angle. Basically, you see that how the puppy is laying down and the person who was taking the picture was higher than the puppy. So this is what, it, what we call the, a high angle. And angles, they really make a difference when you're taking a picture because you can, you can take pictures of the same thing from 50 different angles and you will see the difference that it will make to make you either, you can look fatter, uh, slimmer, better, you know, depending on the, on the angles that you take, that's going to make a huge difference um, on the way how you take your pictures. This is angle, angle, which is basically the way how we normally take pictures. I mean, just like the eye level, um towards our subject and then of course low angle which is which will give you another you know another different look on the pictures that you are uh taking uh, taken i'm sorry uh level horizon basically with this one when you're taking pictures like this you're trying to make a separation from the subject and the back uh, and and the background you can see how the shares they make a separation from the subject because you want to create uh, the main dimension when you taking when you are taking pictures like this one. Uh, next one, do, 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 do. Uh, fill the frame. So this is another one of my favorite type of photography. With fill the frame, basically you're trying to use your camera or your lens or your iPhone, whatever you're using, just to make sure that when you're taking the picture, your the frame is filled with just the subject. Probably I think this is a kiwi in the left, probably a flower and the cat and, and the cat and this is a really easy technique um to do and to create like different um images next one uh leading lines leading lines another of my favorites basically leading line leading lines basically the lines will help you to direct where i mean it, they will help you to tell you i mean to tell the viewer where they have to see for example if we see the steps and here where, where the lady is walking, you see how the lines are basically leading your eyes towards the lady that's there. And then if we see the photograph on the right, we see how all the lines that are here on this installation, I guess, how all the lines are kind of like telling you, hey, look at this lady in the circle in the center because they're leading your eyes towards the subject, towards this lady that is walking there uh next one this is a different one uh the quality of light basically depending the time of the day that you are taking pictures your pictures are going to look very different so for example if you have direct light <coughs> i'm sorry this is how it's going to look if you have direct light if you had the light in the back or if you have uh if you are taking pictures under the shade depending where you're taking your pictures it's going to make a huge difference when it comes to color uh, and the quality and the way how your picture the picture looks. Personally, I like to take pictures during sunset and I like to take pictures on their shadows. I do not like to take pictures like at uh, 12, 1 p.m. I do not like the time of the day to take pictures, especially if I'm doing portraits. Next one, this I is quality heard, of life. Mr. Yeah. Luis, I have heard that the hour before sunset and the hour after sunrise are called the photographer's hours. Yeah which is where they are called golden hour. Yeah, yeah, that's like basically anytime that a photographer, not all the photographers, but most photographers, they would love to just photograph right like an hour before sunset or an hour before sunrise because during that time, <clears throat> I'm sorry, this, this sky and the song is just like, 
it's just a pain. It's just like this, uh, this like um, magical thing happening when you get all these beautiful, the beautiful colors on the sky. Um, you know, like it's kind of like gold. It, it, this, this like golden um, energy that you have, and like um, shadows are super nice. The lighting of your soldiers is really nice. So basically, that's the best time of the day to do. I mean, you can do pictures any time of the day that you want, but that's those are the best times for photographers to do pictures in, if they are doing pictures outside. There is also what is called blue hour, which is after sun, right after sunset. It's like blue hour, blue hour, which still good. It's different, but still is a good time um, to do to do pictures. Like for example, uh, we see on this one quality of light, the shades. This is another one of my favorites. I mean, for me, I feel shades give you more control of your photographs or your colors and it gives you control of what you're actually creating. I love taking pictures under the, sorry, under the shade because once I'm doing post-production and editing, it allows me to have more control of my colors and the things that I do to make my pictures the way I want them to look. Uh, next one, do, 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 do. all right. So this is uh, midday. For example, you see how bright it is and how hard the light it is on the subjects, which is a okay look. Personally, I don't like it. I don't like to take pictures during this time of the day. But yeah, you can see um, how they look. Uh, next one, uh, quality of light, sunset. This is an example of what we were just mentioning now, Pastor Mark. Sunset, you see how the shadows are like really soft, how you see what well, this is not, um, you cannot see like really a lot of color in the back, but still you can see how the, the sunset uh, how the the song is like um, hitting hair from the back and it gives you like that golden, that glow that a lot of photographers like. Personally, like I said, sunset time, shadows is the best time, best situation to take pictures um, of a person. Uh, this is for example, uh, the correct exposure. For example, um, when we say the picture is underexposed, it's big, what? Because the picture is too dark. Overexposed, <coughs> I'm sorry, overexposed, the picture is too bright and the correct exposure, basically it will give you colors that are similar to real life colors. And that's the goal of every photographer to actually have the right exposure, the right setting to get an image that actually looks like what your eyes are seeing at the moment. So that's what, that's what will be the perfect exposure. And of course for that, you need, to, you need to understand, I mean, now the iPhone will do it for you. You don't actually need to worry about that. But if you're using a camera or you're using like an old camera, it, you will have to do the process of like, try, play with the settings uh, until you get the right exposure. Uh, next one. Yeah, this is for example, uh, this one is the use of flash. So when you're, you know, sometimes when you take a picture and you see the picture is so overexposed and it's so wide, so bright, and you're like, what's, what happened? What's wrong with, what's wrong with the picture? Or it was because probably you were using flash and you were way too close to your subject. So as you can see on the examples that we have here, you can see how the guy in the back, how he's almost uh, normal, but then the one in the and up front, you basically cannot see his face of the girl. Here, here's another example um, of how to use flash. You see how did you see the difference on the girl who's like closer to the camera and the ones that are in the back. And then there's another example here. So, here it will show you the different the different the difference that it makes um mm -hmm. depending how close and how far you are to the flash when using flash um with your um camera and basically that was it that was the end of the presentation like i told you it was basically to give you an idea of how some techniques of photography work how film photography actually works and how the process of film photography at some point evolved into digital photography, iPhones and Canon and Sony cameras, uh, which is a type of photography most basically all the kids know today and like basically what we use in a daily basis to create pictures to post on social media or to take um, take videos. Uh, just a little quote before we end the presentation. Uh, to, to, to. Ansel Adams says, you don't take a photograph, you make it. So whenever you're, you're, you're taking a picture, you're actually not taking it, you're making it. And it doesn't matter how silly, how stupid the picture may look at the end of the day, 
those pictures are memory and that's time. Those are times that you will never be able to go back. So when you're deleting pictures, just be careful. Just look at it before you delete the pictures. Or when you're throwing away all pictures that you have at home, just be careful because those are memories that you will never be able to go back. And you should be grateful that you actually have those pictures with you because they will allow you to remember those times in time where you may, when you were probably happier or a different stage in your life. And those signs, those are times that we will never be able um, to go back. So those are memories that are there with us and, and we have to be grateful for that. Also, if you want to follow me on Instagram, where I post a lot of my work, uh, the work that I do as a freelance photographer, feel free to do that. Um, it was a good time. I hope that you learned something from the presentation, guys. So you made it. Thank you so much. <laughs>